Welcome to the third episode of the Triathlete Hour. I'm Kelly O'Mara, the Editor-in-Chief of Triathlete, and today I'm talking to Ben Hoffman. Ben got super philosophical with us about finding the positives even in this tough time, coming back to run his way to fourth at Kona last year, and what made him think he could even be a pro triathlete right out of college in the first place. Plus, he says his one last big goal before he retires is to win it all on the big island. First, though, I chatted with Jordan Blanco about the new virtual races from Ironman, what we liked, what we didn't, and what we think happens from here with virtual racing. Be sure to subscribe to the Triathlete Hour on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss any episodes coming up. But now, let's get to it. Well, thanks for joining us, Jordan. It feels like a little weird to be talking by computer since I could have just driven to your house if we weren't on whatever this is called, pseudo lockdown I, thing. I know. it's uh, We are only a few miles away and, uh, and pretty local, but um, uh, it's good to see your face anyway. And <laughs> uh, If you don't know Jordan, guys, uh, Jordan Blanco, I mean, what is it you do? You do marketing, you represent athletes, you kind of run up some events, you do a lot of stuff in the triathlon. Yeah, I've been involved in triathlon um, for almost 20 years now, um, managing pro athletes like Taylor Spivey, who's a potential Olympian, Kevin Collington and Sarah Piampiano, who who are in the kind of long course, uh, 70.3 in Ironman distance racing, Um, but also working with uh, some local brands doing content production like Cliff Bar, for example, and, and I've worked with Purple Patch Fitness in the past. Um, and then I'm also an athlete. Um, I continue to race, um, competitively for my age group. And I also coach a handful of local athletes here in the Bay area. So yeah, I've got a handful of, uh, a bunch of different buckets going on and it's all related to lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole triathlon thing. And you know, and the reason I wanted to talk to you is because you did the whole, I don't know what we're calling it, VR1 race event, Ironman virtual club thing this week. And at one point, I looked at the leaderboard and you were in the top 10 in the world with your 24-minute blistering 5K. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that was uh, in spite of the headwind as I battled down to the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, you know those headwinds quite well. If you're, if you're trying to run down to the Golden Gate Bridge, you get quite an offshore wind. Um yeah, I mean, I did participate in the event when I saw it pop up uh, on my radar about a week ago. I looked at my training schedule and that the event's a 5K run, a 90-kilometer bike, and a 21-kilometer run fit approximately into my schedule. Um, I didn't plan on racing them, but I knew by participating, it would help keep me accountable to the schedule I had anyway. And uh, as much as I'm pretty motivated, uh, anything that gives us a little extra motivation these days in, uh, is, is a positive in my book. Yeah, I'm definitely lacking motivation. But I think we also both, because I signed up too and I didn't race because I didn't feel like it, but I wanted to test it out. And I think we both wanted to test it out. So I signed up for the virtual club, which I wrote about some online. If you guys haven't tried the virtual club, I like outlined how it works. But it's essentially kind of just a club like any like a Strava club or any or a Zwift club there are challenges there are leaderboards there are workouts you can see you get points you can turn those points into coupons whatever right. um but then you can also sign up for one of these virtual races and that was like a little complicated I I think you had like some problems yeah, with it and I, I, and credit to Ironman to some extent that they've pulled this together I, I think they've been planning on some virtual events and virtual racing uh, down the road, and they hopefully sure. moved the calendar forward. So I, the sign up process was not streamlined. They're using no. com to do the sign up process, but then you have to connect all your um, um, devices, like your Garmin, yeah, yeah. and then so you somehow need to register on one site, connect it to the other site. There's got to be some emails and some bib codes entered back and forth, and. Uh, yeah, I, I basically couldn't get entered because my bib code was missing a digit. Um, thankfully, in my case, I'm connected enough to Ironman. Did you did you like text somebody imported in Ironman and ask them to fix it? Is that what I you did, did? I did. And they rallied, <laughs> um, but Active did eventually get back to me too. Um, it just took them a little longer, but I, I did appeal to the the higher sources first. Uh, so we got that sorted. Um, then it happened to my husband too. So. <laughs> but you eventually were able to do the and I keep saying race in quotations the event because I really don't feel like people 
I don't feel like this was top level racing yet. I feel like everyone was just sort of testing it out. The times kind of suggested it wasn't like a full on race for most people. We were just sort of like seeing how it worked. Um, and how did it work for you once you went and did the race? And then so the race itself is me just executing my workouts how would have how I would have done anyway. Like my didn't my coach was not asking me for an all out five kilometer run. I had an easy three hour bike on my schedule. So um, I did that fairly easily. I think the challenge is coming is when I look at the results and how different devices treat those results, it, it causes issues. So on my five kilometer run, I ran from the house. I have a, a, a big six lane highway to cross. So I pause my watch to cross the road. Um, should that be allowed to be counted in the results? And then um, I had that crazy headwind to deal with down to the Golden Gate Bridge. So uh, there were all these well, that is questions what it is. Yeah. arising in my very first five kilometer run. I also think that I looked at some of the results. So right now, the way it works or the way this race has worked and the way I think the one coming up this next weekend will work is you just go ahead and do the thing on your own GPS device. You upload it using whatever system you use, you know, Garmin Connect, Strava, whatever. Um, you can even do the rides in Zwift, though I know some people had some issues. They were messaging me about issues with those uploading. Whatever. You do that, and then it uploads, and then there's a leaderboard. Right. Exactly. So I did my but first one. What I was noticing was in this... <laughs> Sorry. Well, I was noticing in this leaderboard, <laughs> yeah, there was like a an age group girl who did the 56-mile bike or 90K bike in 137 you know like there are some crazy times on there that don't seem right. right and I think some of that could be potential cheating but I think some of it's just inadvertent because of the way devices were caught let's take the example for me on the bike I use my Garmin because that's what um, captures my heart rate and my Garmin laps I think I don't even know how it calculates distance when I'm riding Athena <laughs> on my Garmin so it laps five miles between 11 and 13 minutes, which is an insane speed that I rarely achieve riding outside. And so my bike time, according to Garmin, was two hours and 13 minutes. Which is quite which good. Faster, Very fast. My fastest ever <laughs> half Ironman bike split was a 216, so I PR my personal limit, <laughs> but I only rode 130 watts. So that's a little dubious. But then on Zwift, right. I, could, I, I did 56 miles in 240 low 240s 241 42 something like that again riding pretty easy but i picked the flattest course i could find on zwift oh uh, i didn't even think about data that. sources i had a massive discrepancy and i wasn't trying to do, right. it's just like i was just riding my bike at 130 watts yeah that's true i didn't even think about zwift courses because i'm not really a zwifter but i was also looking at some of the pros then the pros then raced their own race on Saturday and Sunday, and they did it a little more calculated, like it was a little more calibrated and checked by Iron Man, but still it was like weight self-reported. And I was thinking about at one point, Strava was convinced I weighed 250 pounds, like no matter how many times I changed it. <laughs> and I weigh like half that, right? So these things can get really easily messed up. It's it's a little right, and And even like power meters, I mean, yes, you'd think a watt's a watt, but power meters use different ways to measure um, those things have to be calibrated. Um, environmental conditions of, of altitude impacted the races this weekend too. Some people were racing in Boulder. Some people were like racing at uh, sea level too. And so, I mean, even as as even like even if you did a weigh in, um, I still think you would have these equipment challenges. It doesn't make it entirely a level playing field, even at the pro level. Um, and and again, even if they're trying to cheat or not I think there's just some challenges inherent when you're not all in the same room and in being put under the magnifying glass well so the pro races let's talk yeah. about that for a second because on Saturday the women raced and Jocelyn McCauley ended up winning and and Tim O'Donnell accidentally unplugged Miranda's <laughs> uh smart trainer and then on Sunday the men raced and I know originally they had wanted to have them like you're saying in a room together yeah. in Boulder on like a smart trainer and it would then, you know, people could ride with them in quotations on, you know, the Ruby platform, but then they weren't able to do that given like increasing restrictions on group gatherings and all that. So they did it all remotely. Yeah. And so everybody was riding at their I own mean, house. That was a right? great insight into what everyone's living situation looks like. You know, they're all <laughs> riding in their pinky or 
bedroom or living room, like the cats and dogs are coming in, as you mentioned earlier, husbands start tripping over power cords and they eliminate you from the waste. Um, so yeah, we got like the full uh, uh, gamut of, uh, of things that happen when you're working and living at home, right? Like, uh, I think Jocelyn's daughter was like writing jokes or was involved somehow too. And uh, I think they did a really nice job and made it kind of entertaining for two and a half hours. Uh, would it, I, Actually, I think they took the prize overall prize money away and just um, gave the athletes prizes for the preens because they recognized that yeah. it wasn't necessarily a way to calibrate and truly allocate a winner um, given the circumstances. So I think that was smart. Um, but hey, I haven't seen any live sporting action for about a month now, <laughs> and I, I was feeling that loss, and this was actually really pretty entertaining. And- was it okay? Okay, I was like watched a little bit, and then I was just like, I don't know, I can't, I can't handle just watching avatars go around the Boulder course. Um, I was doing other stuff but yeah, at, at the same time, but I had it on <laughs> in the background, admittedly. But yeah, the prize money. I asked Jocelyn McCauley, who technically won the race, um, how it worked, and she said they all got two thousand dollars. I guess you could call it appearance fee, but $2,000. And then there were preems that paid $250 each. And then that was kind of it, which is obviously not how Iron Man has historically done prize purses. And so there was some, I don't know what the word would be, but you know, it wasn't open to all pros. It was invite only. So there were some people a little upset about like, well, they just invited these people and then they paid them. But that is how the world works. So Yeah, and I think they'd initially tried to like have it in their recording studios. I think it was one in San Diego, one in Boulder. And so they'd initially in, gone out to those um, to invite those athletes, um, some of which couldn't make it. I know Sam Appleton had been considered or was in the running at some point. I mean, there's potentially some conflict too, since they're running, and we haven't talked about this, but they ran the pro race on a platform called Ruby.com, which um, right. has these simulated courses. And potentially for a lot of the pro athletes, like let's say a Lionel Sanders or a Holly Lawrence who have contracts uh, with Zwift, might not be able to participate in events on on a competing platform. So there are potentially conflicts of interest there too for some athletes. I did notice, uh, speaking of that, yeah. Zwift hosted its own pro virtual racing this weekend, which Lionel Sanders did participate in. And there was some kind of side eye shade throwing on Twitter about, you know, this was a real fair pro race as opposed to other ones out there. So there's definitely, you know, everyone's remote. No one's doing like silk robed weigh-ins like you were doing (laughs) (laughs) doing like calibrations of of trainers. And then I did, I I think there was a video uh, made of the Zwift race that Al Lionel participated in. I watched it and it was kind of fun because like, not necessarily watch the video live, but Lionel had added some commentary of the way they use Discord, which is a kind of radio channel right. chat that I'll get to that in a second because I've been using that. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm technically astute here, but um, I really appreciate the way that his, it was almost like being in a bike race. He said his teammates were giving him feedback and like telling him what to do. And he's getting like, as if it was like race radio in a bike race. Um, but um, huh. that was okay. a, a really neat um, use. And so t- Discord is, a, as I said, like a radio channel. And I typically ride once a week with a bunch of women here in the Bay Area. Uh, a lot of them are pro athletes, Chelsea Sodaro, Sarah Piampiano, um, Kelsey Withrow, Mary Robbins. And we haven't been able to do our rides recently together, we, typically on Wednesday. And so last week we did a little ride on Zwift and then we opened a Discord chat line. So we're all riding on the same course on Zwift while chit-chatting away. It was all. And okay. like You guys liked it? I have not gotten into that yet. I've just been watching Cheer on uh, Netflix while I ride my trainer. So, I better be- um, Is there anything? So are you going to do any more of the uh, virtual racing? Is there anything else you want to add about, you know? the future of virtual racing? Because I think we're only going to see more. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One, as I mentioned up front, it it held me accountable for getting my workouts done. And I think the, the, the benefit down the road for Ironman of this is, is in the community aspect, getting athletes, potentially using the club system they have, getting athletes together in the, especially in the current environment and and achieving like workouts. I, I do think there's a challenge when you start trying to rank people, but if they can, 
focus more on the Camuardian community, I think that's a, a positive for everybody in the triathlon community. Yeah. And before they hand out 70.3 world spots, I know, I know that they're working on trying to figure out how to make sure it's fair. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that and they, they are working. I think they're working around the clock behind the scenes these days with all the race cancellations and figuring everything out. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely going to be hard to try and give out those slots virtually, but Hey, hey they're trying something. They're trying to be innovative. And so um, I, I'm going to support them for, for doing that. For, for trying. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jordan and uh, good luck with all of your virtual training. Thank you. Good to see you. Do you want a new bike? Of course you do. And right now we're giving one away. Through May 15th, you can enter to win the Quintana Roo PR62 that's currently on the cover of Triathlete Magazine. Just go to triathlete.com backslash win this bike to enter. Now, here's our conversation with Ben Hoffman. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ben, for joining us from your home in Tucson. You're in Tucson, right? And you guys are on. That's right sort of lockdown or shelter in place or something? Yeah, I mean, I actually should know the terminology and I don't, but basically in the last uh, March 31st, so yesterday, we uh, were sort of mandated to stay home except for essential activities like right. shopping for groceries or I think a little bit of exercise, which is good for us, and then you know a handful of other things. But yeah, we were, we're finally on the same page as everyone else here. Uh, it took Arizona a little while to, to come around, so... Yeah, maybe they were hopeful that like our warmer weather would be, <laughs> you know, influencing this virus or something. But no, I think we don't have the same numbers from, you know, whatever I've been seeing. Um, of course, it's hard to filter through all of the information that's out there. And uh, I think it's easy to see what you want to see in the news. But I, I don't, we definitely don't have as many as like New York City, for example, but, uh, oh, for sure. you know, yeah. we also probably have no idea how many we really have. So better safe than sorry. I keep realizing that every time we record, I feel like I need to say what day it is so that by the time this airs, like if anything changed, so it is like April 1st, as we're talking, this will run next week sometime. And so, you know, things are changing so fast. It might Yeah. So don't hold me to anything people. <laughs> Exactly. And actually what I would say is it's March 32nd. I saw that somewhere and I thought that was pretty funny. That's good. Like, yeah. Like, what the heck? Like, what happened in March? It's still going. <laughs> and also, like, we're boycotting April Fool's this year. No jokes, guys. Can't handle That's it. That's right. Nothing funny is, al is allowed here. So, totally serious. But most of the pros I've been talking to, you guys have been saying life isn't actually changing that much. Because you weren't, it's not like you went to an office and now you don't have an office, right? So, for most people, besides the fact that, you know, training is, like, a little different, they've been saying it really hasn't changed their day-to-day -day that much is that like what would, you're experiencing yeah i would say that's relatively accurate i mean and that, that is by no means to minimize what's going on in the world i mean i think um i am a bit overwhelmed for sure by you know the gravity of the situation um and for sure my own life has been impacted but i'd be lying if i said that it was uh as dire as other people uh you know i think for us we're able to still continue training you know and uh it's not the same. Definitely, we've had to modify some things, but uh, and for sure, when it comes to the racing schedule and goals and things that we had, all of those things have been altered and changed, and you know, don't have a really clear picture right now. But um, yeah, I don't. I by no means do I think that my life has been impacted as much as other people. And in fact, I feel like every day um, when I talk to other people, when I read things. Um, you know, I'm always sort of surprised by a new story of somebody who was impacted in a way that I never even thought was a thing until I read about it or heard about it. So, um, yeah, my eyes are constantly open to other people's struggles. And, um, fortunately I'm in a position, I think where, yeah, I'm able to actually think about other people a little bit because <laughs> I don't have to think about myself as much. Um, so that's a good thing, I think. That's good. And yeah, and you even have a whole setup at home, right? So your your training hasn't even been too impacted, right? More or less. Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate in the sense that I have like a master spas here that I can swim in a little bit. I think that's definitely a bonus compared to a lot of people. Pools are closed everywhere. Um, they've been closed here for a couple of weeks as well. 
Um, and then of course I have a trainer set up a treadmill and then some strength training stuff in the garage as well. I am still going for some runs and an occasional bike ride. I'm not doing everything indoors, but I'm trying to be super smart because I just don't want to be that guy who, no. you know, adds stress to uh, a hospital in a time like this. So it's, uh, yeah, definitely trying to minimize risk and also continue to do my job on some level because I want to be ready for, you know, when, when the time comes to be racing again. Yeah, because you were supposed to do South Africa, right? And obviously that got canceled. Do you even, how do you adjust from there? Do you even have any plans the rest of the year? Or are you kind of like in the same boat everyone else is just like waiting to see? No, like, I, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, don't even... I don't have any inside information <laughs> and small correction there. Sorry. I actually was planning to do St. George. Oh, um, right. Okay. This year we decided um, to not go back and defend the title in South Africa. I've been going there the last four years. So I, completely understand right. why you thought I was going there again. And actually, who knows, maybe I will get a chance <laughs> to race it because apparently they've moved it to like November 15th, I want to say. Okay. Um, but no, we were planning to do St. George and, you know, a lot of that had to do with just the fact that we've had a, a daughter now, you know, we have a six month old child, Josie, and we were kind of looking at things and saying, well, the travel there is really difficult. And I felt like everything was delayed by like a month this year. Um, I raced, Ironman Florida to qualify early for Kona and oh, I kind okay. of pushed my season a little bit longer and so I think I just needed a little bit more recovery and so normally where I'd be kicking things off January 1st full gas like getting back into it getting ready for you know a, a late March early April race in, in Ironman South Africa I decided to push that back by a month plus I have a huge history in St. George um defending champion from 2012 there oh and, yeah okay yeah so the last time they had a full and it got me really excited they had that again so anyway we had decided to do that and <clears throat> really um i'd be lying if i said that the training was like absolutely perfect this year i did get a little bit sick in january and then you know just a couple of small setbacks where it was like a little bit more of a grind this year but literally and of course everyone every pro is like i was the fittest ever right before this hit you know <laughs> right, but right, right. You totally i was actually like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was actually like getting kind of fit finally after like a period of grinding where i was like okay i'm starting to see that this is coming together um and things were trending well towards that uh but you know since that's happened we've obviously backed off the gas a little bit and you know kind of reset a little bit with the idea that hopefully um at a minimum something like kona might happen although Every day that goes by, I'm like a little bit more concerned that that might also not happen. So yeah. yeah, I'm in the same boat as everyone else. To go back to your original question, I don't have any real clarity on the season. We've revamped our race schedule with like a new plan completely um, that doesn't start assuming racing until like July, which I think okay. is like, you know, optimistic, whatever. But possibly, <clears throat> Potentially yeah. optimistic. Yeah, exactly. Um, but kind of gives me like <laughs> a sense of hope and direction <laughs> a little bit and uh you know, it's not that I'm not training every day. I still am. But like, of course, you know, you need to kind of like have some idea about periodization for a race and a schedule and a goal. And, and you, so that's kind of, I mean, I guess you also are in the position where you already in theory, like you have your Kona qualification. So you kind of are, because obviously that's going to be a whole other question, like how they're going to deal with that. But there are people who got in, got in a, a qualification at a spot already. Right. So you don't have to worry about yeah, that much. Yeah. It's you know? such a trippy, tri like, trippy tricky <laughs> um you know subject maybe both i don't know but yeah i feel like it's one of those things where like i'm like well i don't want to be penalized or not rewarded for the fact that i actually did pursue this kona spot and get it on the other hand i know guys like jan ferdano and sebi for example who's a friend of mine they deserve to be there there's no question if we have a kona but forcing them to do a race in something like august or right, right. you know september or whatever crazy um, wouldn't really be fair either. So it's, it's like, yeah, I feel like maybe, I don't know, th there's so many, uh, moving parts and pieces and I'm sure, you know, that might not even be the, the biggest concern, uh, for Ironman at all. Oh, it's uh, a concern. I think they are getting a yeah. lot of questions from a lot of people about what is going to happen with Kona. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I, and I mean, I think bigger picture too, like I would like to say, you know, that, I, of course this affects me and it's something I focus on and like I care about, but you know, I think also if I'm honest, um, one thing that has happened for me during this time is that like, I definitely, it puts things in perspective where I for sure know I'm probably not going to be, you know, racing more than another four or five years at a really high level. It's, you know, and 
Um, so that, that sort of time frame is coming to a close for me, I guess you'd say in my professional career after being, you know, being at it for 15 or so years. And, um, and yeah, this is really important. I think sport is super important, but yeah, bigger picture stuff, like people are dying and, you know, um, businesses are failing, people are losing their jobs. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, I don't want to make it sound like Kona is the only thing that I'm thinking about. It's definitely not. Um, but yeah, I, I, hopefully it'll happen. You know, I hopefully it'll be in a position in the world where we can have it. And hopefully there'll be a way to um, figure out a system for qualification or whatever it is for pros that's, that's fair and equitable for everybody. Yeah, I and mean, I think we're all kind of in the similar boat where it's like, I want the world to be in a place that Kona can happen. And I don't, you know, and that would be a nice bonus perk if it does. Um, but I also don't want us to be in such a bad, a bad situation that we, we can't have it happen. Um, we were talking to Marinda Carfrey earlier today and she suggest she had a, a, these are all like everyone's speculating. This is just an idea, but she thought it would be <laughs> amazing to do like a top 20 from last year, auto qualify, and then use the PTO rankings, which I don't, I can't, I don't, that's like a good idea. I don't know how they would do that. Um, but yeah, I feel like everyone's throwing out ideas these days, you know, we're all like, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think everyone is like, yeah, I mean, right. Like we're all kind of like looking for clarity and like a really unclear and really uncertain time. And I think that's just what humans do. And um, yeah. And I guess on that note, I would just say like, we don't, we just don't know. Right. Like you kind of have to prepare for multiple scenarios and you just kind of have to roll with it and take it day by day. And hopefully, you know, you can continue doing some semblance of what you were doing before because a, hopefully you didn't hate what you were doing, <laughs> you know? Um, and so you're just doing it anyway because you actually like to do it and B, like, I think that you have to be prepared for the time that comes when we are back to again, somewhat normal life, even though I do think there'll be lasting implications from this, um, across the board. So yeah, it's really difficult to say. And, um, again, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, probably not the biggest concern in the world, but yeah, we'll see. I, I would love to see it for our sport. And like you said, hopefully it's in a time and a place where, you know, everything is safe enough for that to happen. I yeah, a, for sure. You know, it would be a good indication that we've made good progress against this. If we can get a bunch of people like sweaty people together in clothes <laughs> in an Island, it's good. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, there, it, I, you mentioned kind of the economy and people losing their jobs. And obviously that's like a big issue too. And I have been really curious about how pro athletes are making it work given so many of them rely on races. I think you're in a pretty, like you're pretty okay. Right. You said like you have pretty solid sponsors and you're doing well, but you obviously know a lot of pros who relied on races, prize purses, uh, sponsor deals that were dependent on race finishes. I'm guessing you're talking to them. How are they dealing? Like, how are, you know, are we going to see a lot of people kind of move on after this year? Like not make it through this year? What's going to happen? Um, well, considering it's April 1st right now, we <laughs> did see Richard Murray announce that he was retiring. You know, yeah. of course it was a fake one, but uh, <laughs> no, it, it, made, it got me thinking, interestingly <laughs> enough, where I was like, you know, there are probably going to be people yeah. like I was out, you know, for a short bike ride today. Um, and I was just thinking about it. And I was like, there's going to definitely be professionals probably where this was that pivotal moment where, you know, for whatever reason, something that was outside of their control, you know, kind of influenced them to make a decision to move on. And yeah, it was kind of, it was a, it was like a sad moment for me where I was like, I, I've always looked at my career and thought back and been like, I feel like I've made really good decisions. And like, I've worked really hard at relationships with sponsors and I've um, worked really hard at bettering myself as an athlete and performing on the race course. But, you know, you have to acknowledge the role of like luck in your life too. And, uh, things that just kind of come together that are total wild cards. And, um, and yeah, it does. I mean, it makes me a little bit sad to think about these people because I'm sure it's going to happen. I always told myself starting the sport that like making a living at it was important to me. Um, that's always been a priority to like, you know, I mean, of course you want to just, do it for the love of the sport, but you also want to justify it through an income. Um, especially when you add something like a, you know, a family, like a daughter, right, to the right. they would like you to have an income. <clears throat> right. Yeah. They don't, they're not saying it like overtly, but <laughs> you definitely feel a little bit more pressure to, to perform on that side of things. And so, yeah, it's always been a priority to me. And I would say that, you know, I had to kind of see those markers along the way in my own career in order to continue with it. And, yeah, it's hard to know what things are going to look like when we come out of this from a lot of standpoints. I mean, <clears throat> people that are 
sponsors, you know, that are um, businesses in the industry. Um, Ironman itself, uh, event production period. I mean, it's really difficult to know. So yeah, it's just a hard time. And um, I'm hopeful that we, you know, come out of it stronger. But yeah, I think it's just kind of like I said, day by day right now. Um, it's really hard to say. Yeah, and you're pretty involved with the PTO, and you guys did a a thing. I don't know where you <laughs> sent out checks, basically, right to the top 100 pros. Like at the, it was supposed to be at the end of the year, kind of as a bonus structure, but it was like, hey, everyone's screwed right now. I take the money right now, <laughs> um, which I thought was pretty cool. You guys also in that because I talked to you about it. Some of the top like 10 guys and women were going to try and like re- do some events to raise money and like reallocate it to the other pros, right? H- has that worked out? What's like come of that? How did that all come about? Because it's like, it's kind of cool. Yeah. So for those who aren't familiar, the PTO is a professional triathletes organization. And um, basically it's all the pros. Well, anybody who wants to be part right. of this can be as a professional athlete. And uh, yeah, they have been trying to get this off the ground for a really long time. And finally, um, at the beginning of this year, they were able to secure funding, uh, crank start investments. Mike Moritz, uh, based out of San Francisco, he stepped up and decided he wanted to participate in this and, and really back the, you know, the group and their vision for kind of furthering the sport and helping professionals grow. Um, and yeah, we were really, really lucky to have his backing. And I think, um, like you said, we basically decided that because we, it's hard to say if and when any racing will happen, um, you know, we had this bonus uh, pool scheduled basically for your final ranking at the end of the year. And they decided to basically pay that for based on your ranking, either March 15th or at the beginning of the year, whichever one was better. So that was kind of cool too, that they actually gave for the people who did get to sneak in a race right. uh, in the first part of the year. If that improved your ranking, you actually would then get paid potentially a little bit more if you had moved up in the rankings, but you weren't penalized if you hadn't been able to race either. So yeah, that for me, that was a huge, um, you know, bonus that, that, uh, definitely puts us in like a more comfortable position to ride this out. Um, but yeah, I think like you personally and like other pros, like put them in a more comfortable position. It absolutely did. I mean, I would, I, I don't think that anybody, um, wouldn't have benefited from receiving a check from the PTO. Yeah, I would like um, a check. Everybody would like a check. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, all you have to do is get pro <laughs> license and then get ranked in the top 100. But no, we, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super pumped about, you know, the fact that they, I think that there's been some struggles to get this off the ground, basically. And, um, you know, it's like the worst timing possible that we finally get it off the ground. And then, um, we really aren't able to race or do, especially the Collins Cup race, which right. was a big plan um, at the end of May. But there's still some hope that maybe, maybe at the end of the year, we could get something off the ground or race. But there's just so many logistics because they really want to do incredible video coverage. There's a lot of components to it um, that they want to get right. But yeah, the point is that like they've really stepped up in a big way and they're not going away. And I guess that's something that I would really drive home to people out there is that I think Maybe they feel like, oh, this is a flash in the pan. It's not something this guy's really committed to. But um, from my discussions with Mike in person in San Francisco in January this year, he really is committed to like a long-term vision um, of, you know, whatever it takes basically to get this off the ground. And so I'm optimistic that, you know, this is just a blip in the radar that everyone's going to have to adjust to. Um, But like, again, hopefully we'll come out of this stronger and, uh, you know, at least, maybe at the end of the year, but for sure next year, be back to it and, you know, do what we had planned to enact this year. But in the short term, the pros out there will have, you know, or at least some of the pros will have, you know, the benefit of a, of a check to help them ride this out. Yeah. I mean, cause I talked to Mike when you guys was launching too. And so if people don't know, he's like a pretty well-known investor, like YouTube, Google, like pretty early on. And, uh, and he's definitely investing in it as a business though. He definitely like wants this to make money, wants it to be a long-term you know, this isn't a charity, basically. Uh, and I think the the whole idea is like kind of to model it after the PGA, right? And to put on your guys' own events and then use part of those profits to go back to the pros. And then do so you have like kind of a say, right? Isn't that the idea? And then and then do it more is, events. Yeah, definitely. We're all involved in it. And actually, mm-hmm. I just realized, sorry, that I didn't answer the second part of your oh, question. Yeah, that's fine. We're we are. No, no. The, <laughs> the, the top 10 are involved in communications with the, you know, people that are running the PTO, not just the athletes, but also the administrative people. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can, you know, 
generate income, actually additional income for some of these other pros. Um, right now, like I have an interview, like a, another Zoom chat set up for early <laughs> next week. And uh, that's part of the conversation actually is like some of the ways that we might be able to um, activate to get, you know, some energy and, and generate additional income for people. So yeah, those things are happening too. Um, you know, we're all, I think we're all just trying to adapt and like right. figure out different ways, you know, different revenue streams. Um, but yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, Mike's committed to, you know, to the long term, but he also, of course, is treating it like a business. And I think from his experience investing in some of the businesses you just mentioned, and actually, if I'm not mistaken, he might have been one of the bigger investors initially in Zoom as well. Oh, solid. Um, so we're like making you guys money right now <laughs> as we're talking. Exactly. <laughs> and so, but that's my point, right? Is that like nobody knew this pandemic was coming. Right. But he saw the fact that Zoom was probably part of the future of us communicating and having meetings, et cetera. And right now, I'm sure he's benefiting from that, um, you know, financially. But the point is that it took who knows how long Zoom's been around, but like now it's finally big. I think he also has the same vision. He's very patient. And uh, it could be the same way with the professional triathletes organization. And I think that's something people need to keep in mind too. Like, I think there was a lot of blowback or there was some blowback initially. Was some, yeah. And I would say that uh, to the haters out there, you know, nothing is going to be perfect when you first launch it. It never is. Um, but I do think that like, this is a step in the right direction. And the fact that we have a voice and that we're involved and that we're taking steps that I think will ultimately benefit everyone. Um, to me, there's no question because the status quo, just continuing along the path that we were doing wasn't really sustainable or <laughs> anything that was going to actually be positive for pros, right? right. It wasn't going to change anything. So at a minimum, we're trying something now. And I, again, I understand that like there's going to be people who feel left out or feel like things were overlooked. And that's the beauty of this too, is that there's actually an opportunity for us to weigh in and hopefully, you know, make those changes and, you know, be nimble and adapt on the fly so that we can actually um, hopefully incorporate the opinions of the, of the majority, at least um, of professionals out there. Yeah, I think I think for a lot of people who have questions, and I mean, you know, we've been watching this for a few years. I think it was sort of like, oh, now we're just gonna need to see what happens. Now, you know, we need to see the Collins Cup, and so it's unfortunate now that that's like, ooh, but obviously, you know, it is what it is, as we keep saying right now in the world. Yeah, so, and I mean, I'll be honest with you too. Like, there's potential. I'm trying to look at this as a positive too, <laughs> where it's like, no, I mean, really, like we're hunkered down now, and maybe some of the things that we're like. I mean, this is the first time thing. So like now we basically have another year's runway to hone in on some of the details, maybe get right. more people organized, et cetera, to make it even bigger and better. And also to adapt to what this new environment might be to everybody, right? Like maybe people are going to desire a little bit of something different out of the media. And, uh, you know, maybe there's time now to build that in as a, as a bit of a, like a buffer to all that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not all bad. I, I don't think. Um, of course I wanted to race and I was really excited for the format and I still am, but, um, yeah, hopefully it just means that we can like get our ducks even more in a row, involve more people, grow it even bigger by the time we actually get to hit the race course next uh, year. Yeah. For people who don't know, the Collins cup was kind of like a writer's cup style, America versus Europe versus the rest of the world teams of three men, three women. It was going to be like, everyone goes off like three at a time. It's a whole thing. It was going to be very involved. So we'll see it next year. Um, <laughs> In the meantime, are you going to do the virtual racing? Are you like the new VR? Are there so much virtual racing going on? Everyone's launched it. Are you, is that, are you one of the people who's into that or not? Well, the talk was to figure out a way to create a hologram of myself <laughs> so that I could like be doing both at the same time. Okay. But um, no, no, I, I think I'll explore it. You know, I don't really know yet. Um, I guess traditionally I've been more of like the, the outdoor uh, <laughs> guy in terms of training, but um, which is why we split our time between, you know, Arizona and Colorado based on the season. But, um, but no, I think it's, I think it's probably part of the future of things. And I think it's uh, worth, you know, embracing and trying out. I'm definitely not going to say no. Uh, I do think that initially from what I've heard, uh, the opportunity for the professional racing is more restricted to pros like that are based on in one. Boulder. Right. Yeah. And right now we're, I mean, we do have a home in Boulder and we go there in the summer, but, um, right now we're down in Tucson and there's obviously like some restrictions on travel, et cetera. So, hmm. um, whether I'm part of that, I'm not really sure, um, if I'll do, you know, any of that one-on-one -on -one racing to start out with, but 
it seems like a cool format. Um, it's another way to bring us together and to kind of weather the storm a little bit. So yeah, I'm open to it. Um, but I'm also not going to commit and say that it's like going to be my next, you know, thing. Um, hopefully we're back on the real race course. Soon. <laughs> You're not going to like commit to a, you know, virtual marathon on the treadmill. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah. No, people are doing some not. things these days. All right. I'm going to, we're going to take a really short break to run like an ad and then we'll be right back with Ben. Hi guys, I just wanted to cut in here to say thank you for listening to our first ever podcast, The Triathlete Hour, and uh, and be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, so that you won't miss any of the things we have planned or coming, all interviews, news, everything you want to know about triathlon. Now let's get back to it. All right, so we're back and I wanted to go back in time for a second, Ben. You, I just realized, raced college nationals the same year I raced college nationals way back in like 2006. Is that right? That is correct. You were in Reno. Yeah, the year they canceled the swim. Reno 911. Yeah, and it was super cold and miserable. Uh, And so you came up through college try as well. Uh, I went to Berkeley. I think you guys beat us that year and it was very upsetting. Yeah, you guys were definitely one of the powerhouses. And I remember uh, Justin Lau was yes, second. He's a really good friend of mine. And he too. He this, is a really good dude. Yeah. Um, we day, definitely though. became friends. Yeah. And he he made a little bit of a run out of his professional career, but kind of shut it down. Maybe, I don't know, after a couple of years of racing professionally. Um, what I was actually going to say was laughing about that was because to this day, the whole, like when you got second at Kona, he was like, see, I could have been second at Kona. Cause that's how people think, right? You're always like, comparing no, yourself to your best. there's an actual thing. I don't know <laughs> if you're familiar with this. It's called virtual resume. And basically if you've ever beat somebody, you immediately assume all of their results. So <laughs> exactly. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right? Like, for example, I beat Jan Ferdano in Kona in 2014 when I was second, he was third. So I am like a multiple Kona world champion just because I beat Obviously, him. yeah. Right. It's it's pre and post. It doesn't matter. It doesn't like, matter. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the way that it's called virtual resume. So. Right, there you go, guys. Uh, ben Hoffman just gave you permission <laughs> to claim everyone else's results. You have to have beat them at least once, so that's a, that's a caveat. But um, but no, yeah, we, uh, we, we actually had a really strong team, and I think that, that was an interesting year because, of course, you know, I was – of the three sports, my swim was probably the weakest, especially the time. And so I wasn't like, you know, throwing a hissy fit, you know, because they canceled the swim. However, we'd been training in Montana where it was significantly colder than Reno. And we had been doing open water swims in Frenchtown pond, which was, uh, you know, like a local lake that we could swim in. And it was way colder than that. So we were actually, and of course we were like prided ourselves on being super hardcore because we were from Montana. So we were like, what? They're canceling the swim because it's cold. Like this is ridiculous, you know? (laughs) Um, but yeah, we made the most of it. It was pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, good times. I mean, that was definitely the origins of my career, you know, uh, racing for the university of Montana for Grizz Try. So it was fun, fun stuff. Yeah, I, I was just wanted to ask you a little bit about college try because obviously, like it's changed a lot since then over the years. But it seems like it was a pretty big part of kind of getting you into the sport, right? Yeah, um, really quickly before we like get yeah. too far away from. I mean, we're still on it, but like, yeah. were you in the after party? Yes, that's what I'm saying. I was there. I remember okay. that after party. You remember that I got like party. that got like lifted up and I was like crowd surfing. Yes. About, about her? Okay, good. We like I just want to make the sure. after party. That was like our yeah, thing yeah. every year. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, but I but don't no, think, I, mean, I was going to say though, I think college try now that it's going NCAA more, I like went a couple years ago and it's a little bit less, uh, crazy after parties and drinking and, uh, just going to let you know, it, it's, uh, it's not quite as, not quite not as wild. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's probably good, I guess, for overall performance, if we're trying to win <laughs> medals and set people up to be <laughs> ITU athletes or whatever, you know, the idea behind it is exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I haven't kept my finger on the pulse in the same way. I mean, I do know guys like Cliff English, obviously coaching ASU women's team who seem to dominate everything. Um, but yeah, it, it's cool. It's definitely good. Right. I mean, I guess I've always been in a mindset too, where, you know, we can look at things like the PTO or we can look at this as an example, but anytime people advance the sport and it, and it may not be perfect. It might not be exactly what everyone wants to see happen, but um, anytime money comes in, anytime interest is there, I feel like it's good, right? I mean, 
it has an opportunity for the sport to stay relevant and to grow and, you know, to figure out what it is in, in this new time and space. So, um, yeah, I mean, anytime there's a new race, anytime there's a new investor, a new sponsor, whatever it is, I'm always pretty optimistic about it, even if it doesn't involve me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I would say the same thing about this, right? It's another opportunity for kids in college that maybe, um, otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to the sport. Mm -hmm. And it's probably where we're going to find sort of our future talent. Yeah. I think it's paying off a lot for women right now because it's, it's mostly just a women's NCAA sport. Um, right. So yeah, it'll be interesting. I am curious how it'll affect kind of that club scene that like you came out of, I came out of, like so many of my friends came out of. I'm also curious kind of what inspired you to be like coming out of college, I'm going to be a pro. Cause I knew a ton of people who were as good and they're working office jobs now. Like what made you be like, that's it. I can do this. Oh, I mean, fear of <laughs> office jobs, you know, <laughs> I mean, really, I, uh, yeah, the funny thing was the sort of story of my like choice to be a pro triathlete. It's pretty, I don't know. I, I would think it's probably a little bit different than maybe a lot of people's, but I raced <clears throat> that year and became collegiate national champion 2006 in the spring. And then that summer I graduated and I basically hit the road with a guy who then coached me for several years afterwards, huh. Elliot Bassett. Okay. And we lived out of a suburban that my parents lent me, um, you know, which for those who aren't familiar, it's like a bigger SUV and we had camping gear and we literally drove around that entire summer of 2006 and we raced almost every weekend uh, in the Pacific Northwest and, and some in the U S as well. <clears throat> and in Canada at the time you had, the opportunity to win prize money, whether you're a pro or amateur. And so we basically were just chasing like paychecks. And um, I was able to make a little bit of money that summer and basically postpone reality. And then when the summer came to a conclusion, I was like, well, what am I doing? Like, what am I going to do now? <laughs> what am I going to do? I was like, <laughs> well, I made like $3,000 that summer. And I was like, that seems like a pretty good start. You know, like, I feel like I might be able to do this. And uh, there were a number of pros actually in Missoula at the time that I was starting triathlon and so we had some guidance that way and like I saw it as sort of a possibility most of them had other jobs so maybe <laughs> I was being a little bit naive but I also had a normal job for a little while at the start of my uh, pro career I moved back to Colorado I started working part-time at a health department and I trained the rest of the time and I just kind of like chipped away at things you know I mean I just kept trying to perform and I had some okay results at the start of my career but I was always just outside the prize money and uh you know, I just kind of like ground my way through on like a thousand dollars a month that I made at the health department. And, uh, gradually I accumulated, you know, tiny bits of sponsorship that paid small bonuses and whatever else. And I just sort of like built my way up. And then in 2010, I won my first Ironman at Lake Placid and that was kind of like a big launch pad for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, to be, to answer your question, like that literally, I was like, I did not want to get a normal job. That okay. was like what, that was basically what, uh, inspired it. And I really loved what I was doing. That's what I, like when I stepped back, um, at the end of 2006, I had this 30 day window where people that I knew in Montana and Missoula went away to a trip to China and they were like, can you come caretake my house in the woods? It was literally way, 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 way up in the mountains. It bordered, they had 30 acres of their own. It bordered like national forest service land so it was literally like hmm. totally isolated from everything and i just took care of their black labs and i went for runs up in the mountains and like sat there for 30 days and thought about what i wanted to do in my life and like that's what i was like you know what what do i really love what am i enjoying out of my life what do i think i want to do or at least try and for me the answer was pretty clear it was like i want to see how good i can be at this and this is what gives me the most positive feedback on a daily hmm. basis right now and so, yeah, I made the choice to move to Colorado and pursue it. It sounds like very Zen, very like once a runner, go off into the woods and. Yeah, it really yeah. was actually. <laughs> it's super funny to like look back on it now. Cause I was like, it was such a pivotal moment, but like when I was living it, you know, I definitely, I don't think I was very aware of it, you know, that it would really <laughs> kind of set this massive trajectory for me, um, that it was such a, yeah, pivotal determining moment for me, but it really was. And. And no regrets. I mean, it, it, you know, one of the things I remember saying to myself when I was up there, and this sounds like, oh, something you say when you're looking back, but I literally remember being like, I'm going to do this as long as it's fun. And <laughs> when it stops being fun for me, I'm going to really check in and reevaluate and be like, okay, it's time to 
like not be afraid and change life, you know, of course, if that's necessary. There's got to be times it hasn't been fun though. You, there's Absol- gotta be. Absolutely. Okay. No question. Um, but I think, I guess when I asked myself that I was more like, of course, you know, like exercise, good judgment and asking yourself this, like, is it still more good than bad? <laughs> and, uh, most, you know, pretty much every single moment has been that way. Um, when I'm really honest with myself and I look at it in a bigger perspective, uh, the lifestyle we lead, um, the opportunities that we have, you know, I think the, the good far outweighs the bad. And so after all the kind of like grinding year after year, you know, I feel, I feel like we really all kind of thought of you as a workhorse for a long time. And then you got second at Kona. Did that change, like in the triathlon world, I feel like that would change everything, right? Like that would, suddenly people know who you are, like they're calling you, you're not calling them, right? Did it just completely change after that? I mean, I, I definitely think so uh, on a lot of levels. I, I would say, um, you know, I mean, ideally I would have backed up that performance in 2014 with another really strong performance, a win ideally, or, you know, another podium. And instead I like went all in and like overdid it and blew up, which is also like second place syndrome, you know, I mean, it happens a lot. Uh, So I think, you know, some sponsors are like waiting for you to like prove it again. Hmm. And I would actually say that maybe getting fourth place again in 2016 and then doing it again last year, um, we're almost more, beneficial in a way to sort of solidify my position as one of the top long course athletes in the world. Um, but no, I mean, in terms of putting myself on people's radar and proving I could perform in Kona and just like, uh, yeah, a lot of sponsorship stuff, it definitely did change the game. And I, and I mean, it drove it home for me. I was already starting to shift everything towards focusing like my entire season around Kona, but, uh, it definitely, you know, made that quite clear that that's probably the best, uh, you know, thing that a, a long course athlete can do. Um, of course you need to perform too, but like at the end of the day, if you're looking to make a career out of this, um, performance in Kona is still kind of a number one. Yeah. I was actually wondering, it's interesting. You mentioned that, like where someone goes after getting second, how hard that would be. Cause you feel like if you don't win from there, I would imagine I've never gotten second at Kona, but I would imagine <laughs> it feels like you have to win now. Right. Like, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's funny. I've had this conversation with Sebi <laughs> before and like, we've talked a lot about it. And he's like, he said it to me one time and I've sort of like repeated to other people. So I don't want to take full credit, but he's like, we had a conversation where I had gotten, Oh man, what was this? I think it was a year actually it was 2017 when I got ninth and he was maybe third or second, second, maybe. And Jan won or no, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know these things off the top of my head, but okay. Well, no, I should know. I mean, I'm just trying to remember what year it was, or it might've been 16 where I got fourth and he was second. That's when it was. And yeah. And he and Jan had that, that pretty solid battle because then Patrick won the next year, the next year. But anyway, um, point is that we were like sitting there talking and he was like, you know, a lot of people come in here and they're like super disappointed after they get like, they blow up and like they get 25th place and you know, whatever. And he's like, they don't have the right to be upset you know he's like they haven't earned the right to be upset yet because they haven't performed well out here so like the expectation is completely unfounded and like um but then on the flip side when you have performed you know you do have that expectation so anything less than like what you've done out there is difficult to stomach sometimes i will say that like as i've let go of that more though um i think overall my performances have gotten better even my fourth place last year i consider you know, one of my better races ever, even though placing wise, it was fourth and I've been second, I went 802. And like, there's no question that, um, you know, it was one of my better performances, if not my best performance ever. Yeah. I mean, you ran down a lot of people, which I certainly wanted to ask you about. Cause that was, so I was curious kind of you, obviously the year before, um, had a little bit of a rough year, you know, we're hurting stuff and then to come back and then not just come back, but come back at the end of the bike from being pretty far down and run your way all the way up through that. I'm curious how much of that is like a mental game. You know what I mean? Like how much is that? Like, how do you do that kind of in your head and convince yourself that you can? Well, I mean, a lot of it comes through the training. Um, you know, for sure. I knew that I was in a position to run really well and I wanted to make sure that I executed that part of it because yeah, I feel like, you know, historically you look at Kona and like the people who win that race on paper, the majority of the time are running really well. Um, including this past year and, you know, the vast majority of the year. So I wanted to like prove to myself that I could run well and also to kind of put on display 
some <laughs> of the training and some of the improvements that I had made as an athlete with my coach, Ryan Bolton, who's known for his sort of run coaching. Yeah. He does a lot of and, stuff for us, actually. Uh, he just wrote yeah. a book for us on, yeah, he's a good dude and he definitely, um, is a huge part of the team. And so, yeah, I, to, to answer your question, it was a huge mental battle because you're quite, you always have self doubt and questioning when you're out there, no matter how fit you are and whatever's going on in the race, even if you're leading, you do, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I, to, to like really let it go and be like, this is my plan and I'm actually going to do this was maybe as challenging as any other time I've been out there because you do, you start to wonder you're like, well, maybe they're too far away or like, maybe this is a poor choice or like, you know, all these things. And I just had to keep checking in and being like, this is what I trained for. And like, if I do it right, I'm going to find myself somewhere back in the game at some point, you know? At some point. And yeah, even if it's like mile 25, I don't care. Um, you know, and that's kind of what happened actually. I mean, I nearly ran my way onto the podium and, you know, um, if Sebi wasn't such a warrior, I think I would have gotten it, but, uh, you know, he knew I was coming and, and, uh, he's no stranger to the podium himself. So he knew how to defend it, but, um, I laid everything out there and I'm super proud of my race. And I think if I'm honest after 2018 to, if I made any mistake last year, it was probably that, um, maybe I was a little bit too conservative in the sense of like coming back and wanting to prove to myself that I could still perform in Kona at the highest level mm -hmm. instead of just being like, I'm here to win. And like, when you really want to win that race and when you do win that race, you have to be completely unafraid. And there was probably a little part of me that was like, you know, I want to come back out here and have like a really good race. Um, you know, and, and, and not completely explode and blow up and like do a gravel run, which, you know, <laughs> I've done before. <laughs> right. Right. And so, yeah, but I think what was cool is that like, that was the perfect stepping stone to like the end of my career, which is happening now, probably, you know, in the next few years where I can be like, okay, I've shown that I can be second, fourth, fourth, ninth. Like I can be in the top 10. I can be in the top five. Um, you know, I can be right there now. It's just about winning it. And so I don't need to prove that I can get fourth place again. I need to prove that I can win. And so you have to take that final step of just being like completely liberated from any sort of like, attachment to, you know, I don't know, expectations of like, that's pretty good, or, you know, that's a good enough thing. Um, and you just have to really be 100% all in. And so <laughs> this yeah, really feels like Zen Buddhism. Point. Yeah, this really feels like Zen Buddhism with Ben Hoffman, you have to like detach yourself. <laughs> <from expectation. laughs> well, I mean, there's still desire to win, no question, you know, but yeah, you just like, you do, you sort of have to like, let go of all of that. And, uh, and just let it like flow. And, uh, and hopefully I'm in that position now. I think I am, you know, I, I feel, especially after last year, I mean, those are three of my best Ironman performances ever, ever before in terms of, you know, South Africa, um, Kona, and then also Florida. So I know I'm improving. I'm in my best place ever as an athlete. And it's just about like aligning those things in Kona and, you know, bringing it together on the day. It sounds like you guys are all pretty good friends too. I mean, you and Sebi also did uh, Cape Epic in 2018, right? The seven day mountain bike stage race thing so don't sell us short it was eight days eight days it's uh, but I had the never first day it. was a prologue of only like 20 uh, okay. days so it wasn't that big of a deal but it yeah, sounded it crazy was, but yeah it was it was completely crazy um and yeah we are i mean i would say there's a lot of respect amongst the top pros you know uh i think back on the the post race panel in kona and i'm like those guys i I put a post up about it because I was like, this is like ideal for me, you know, being up there with Jan Frodeno, Tim O'Donnell, Sebi, Cam Worf, myself, like these guys are all guys that I totally respect, um, who I know put in an incredible workload to be ready for that race and that are, but also like real people, you know, that. That um, post-race press conference was really funny too. Like yeah, anybody it was to super enjoyable. They need to go find yeah. the video. <laughs> <laughs> it was good stuff. And so, yeah, I think, um, I, I have total respect for them as athletes and people, and it was really, really special to share that time with them up there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we all know right at that level, like what it takes and, and what we put into it. Don't you then also know people's weaknesses? Do you ever feel like, oh, if I like, oh, Sebi can't handle surges. If I like go now, I'll drop him. I made that up, but I don't think that's a real example, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> do you know, like, you know where to hit them, right? Yeah. On some level, I think you do. Um, <laughs> But the problem is that like at the top level too, guys are always aware of their own weaknesses too, and they're working on them. And so maybe when you think you know something, you don't actually. And, uh, 
or maybe, you know, uh, they have a weakness that you don't know about because I do think guys keep their, you know, yeah, they, they keep things close to their chest when it comes to race day, especially in Kona. Like I, I don't think you know about injuries all the time, you know, I mean, um, you don't always know how people's training has gone exactly. You know, it's, uh, it's always a bit of like a, a guessing game. I mean, at the very, uh, there's 10 guys where you can be like, I'm pretty sure that they probably did the work and they know what it's like to be there. And like, unless they really did get injured, um, they're probably going to be ready to go. But yeah, I do think there's like a little bit of secrecy too. And, you know, I mean, I get it. Like I've been there before where you're like, I, I mean, Tim O'Donnell this year is a great example. You know, I think he was being mostly like transparent about his foot injury that he had and like the run training he had done. Um, and I, and, and I, just think that he you know that it actually benefited him in some way where he was able to like up his cycling game a fair bit and focus on the swim a little bit more so he was there all day you know at the front of the race but um but yeah I mean I think you know people yeah you never know exactly out you there. never so know exactly the, oh, yeah. key, the key really the main takeaway I think is focus on yourself and like how you can execute your best race and be ready for every possible scenario and uh you know because it's likely that it'll come up so I feel like this is just like a very deep philosophical episode where you're like <laughs> dropping wisdom. Let's not, let's not give me too much credit here. <laughs> Once you get Mark Allen on the show, you'll be like, oh, that was nothing. Oh, yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. True. All right. Um, I feel like the only other thing, I mean, usually I would ask people about their plans for the rest of the year and everything. But honestly, at this point, like, I don't think you know. And it's too hard to even know. Um, but you have talked a lot about, you know, this seems like it's sort of the end of your career. Maybe you have four or five more years left. Where do you kind of see that going from here? What do you think you're going to do after? Uh, you'd be surprised <laughs> how often I get this question. I'm and I, sure. I mean, and I've cultivated like a, re- like a reasonably good answer, at least from my perspective. And honestly, I don't know. And I, ha- I feel like I have a lot of options in front of me and a lot of opportunities. And I know... Um, that I'm always going to work really hard and feel that sort of innate, like desire to work hard for this, like the feeling of hard work itself, you know, the reward that comes from that. And so typically I think when you work hard at something and you're passionate about it, the results and and the financial side sort of take care of themselves. So I would say I'm not like overly worried about it. And one thing too, that I've realized is that like in life, the pandemic is a great example. You just don't know what's coming. Right. And so like making these big plans, like they oftentimes don't really pan out and you don't know who you're going to meet in a year's time or like the PTO getting off the ground this year. I mean, there's so many things that happen on a yearly basis that it's kind of like almost silly to make massive plans. But what I can say is that I love this lifestyle and I love training and like interacting with people traveling the world. And so I think my instinct is to stay in the industry in some capacity, Hmm. Um, whether that's working with an existing sponsor or somebody new that I, you know, end up with in the future or a coaching or whatever other opportunity. Um, I think it's definitely something that's on my radar, but uh, you know, to give you a concrete answer, I simply can't do that. And I feel like too, another thing about going too far down that road is that it distracts you from where you are right Right. now. And I really want to just continue to like see what I can do in racing and that requires like full commitment. So, um, I'm not making big plans like exit plans right now. I'm just focusing on like training, racing, and, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be back out there really soon. Okay. Um, the last couple of weeks we've been finishing with a, would you rather with like Flora last week and Sarah the week before that. And I was trying to think what would be a good one for you. Um, I feel like given everything, would you rather, like get fourth at Kona every year or win it once and then never be able to like finish it again. Oof, that's thing. That's pretty easy one for me. I would definitely (laughs) want to win it. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I, and look, I, I recognize that like, it doesn't completely change you as a person, but like, I I mean, this is sort of like stealing actually from Jordan Rapp. I remember when he said this one time where he was like, to me, I want to know that I was like the best in the world at what I was doing at least once on one day in my career. And, uh, you know, I feel like I've won races like other big Ironman events and stuff. And I was like, on that day, I was like the best in the world, but it wasn't world champs. (laughs) And so you really want that to align with world champs because that is world champs and everyone prepares slightly differently and more, I would say, 
and it is just the one, you know, that, that has the most pressure and everything else. So yeah, definitely I would choose to win it once. And I, you know, <laughs> I remember Jan giving a victory speech the second time that he won it. And he was like, he was making a comment about how like, you know, you, you have to win it twice. I or remember something that. Like that. I was there. Yeah. yeah. You really have and, to win uh, it twice for people to care. Yeah. Right. But like for me to care, which is your question, <laughs> I would only really need to win it once. And I think, you know, um, hopefully I can do that before my time is done. All right. Cool. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us. It sounds like your baby is waiting for you in the background. So Josie just just woke up. So <laughs> Kelsey's on it, but uh, it's probably time to do some dad duty. So well, thank thanks you. for having me on. It was great to chat. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks to Ben and Jordan for chatting. And thanks to our editor, Kirk, and to our whole team at Triathlete. And thanks to all of you for listening and for sticking with us as we figure out all this virtual tech. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes and keep training.